All right, gentlemen, we get started. Let's start with the uh, listing agreement. And uh, this is not real complicated to go through, so we'll just start at the beginning here. <clears throat> One of the things I do want to impress upon you is to, if you haven't read through these already, is to make sure you read through the agreements and get really familiar so that you're going to be able to not articulate every chapter and verse of these to your clients, but that you're familiar enough where you can definitely have a conversation with them about the things that are important. Obviously recommend that they review any document, any contract, uh, and so on, that they're familiar with it, okay? You don't want to just take advantage. And by the way, the offer to purchase contract, you wanna make sure that they review that long before you have to make an offer so that you don't get stuck in that situation where you've got to chop, chop and get a, a uh, an offer in and they want to sit and go through a 14 page contract. Okay, so they should know the essence of what it is uh, early on so you don't have to go through that. All right, um, <clears throat> first thing, if you remember, there are two things that I want to impress upon you. One is the, um, the uh, fact that you should go to the auditor site and figure out who you're dealing with, who is the seller. So the two documents you should have in your possession, one is a consumer guide, and you should be able to access, before you go to the listing, to the house of the seller, potential seller, you should already have gone to the auditor's site and pulled the auditor's uh, information to know who you're meeting with, what's the story of the house, how long has it been there, you know, what's kind of the history in terms of transfers and so on, okay? So starting with those two documents. The first thing I wanted you to highlight, if you have a highlighter, is that uh, under number one, where it starts out brokerage, and uh, that line, uh, where there's blank lines, we're gonna go through blank, uh, blank lines. The first blank line you're gonna come through is brokerage, grants to, and you can write the word brokerage in there. Now, you want to have the legal name of the brokerage. So make sure that you plug in the right name. They might call it KW. They might call it Keller Williams. They might call it Keller Williams Greater Columbus. Uh, but don't make sure that you, when you are working in contracts that you have proper names and that you have the legal names of the people you're dealing with. Okay? So that first line is the broker. Commencing on, if you want to make a note up in that white space, if you want, um, the list date is the date the client signs the listing agreement. So if you haven't had it signed yet, uh, it begins on the date that they sign the contract. And then I would put in there uh, through and I would figure out what six months from that date is and put that date in. Give yourself six months. Is it typical six months? Mm -hmm. Can it be longer? It Hopefully can be. It take too long to sell it. But... I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it for less than six months. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. That is. It's a. Uh, it's kind of arbitrary. You can put in what you want, but I wouldn't do it for less than six months. And then the address is the legal address from where, gentlemen? Where are you going to get that address from? The auditors. Auditor, yes. Yeah. So just put from address from auditors. And then the next line is list price. Go down the paragraph next blank line is MLS entry date of blank. <clears throat> I would highlight that right there. And the MLS entry date is the actual date you put it in MLS. And here's the thing. Um, we have in this market the ability to either put it on the list date like now, or we can have a coming soon, but it can be no longer than 30 days. In other words, you can't push it out any more than 30 days. 
but I want you to talk to your mentors and trainers about coming soon so that you fully understand that, okay? Because that is a go into MLS and uh, have be fully understand what coming soon means. It, it has definite rules. All right, we go down to under six. There's another line. I would put in anywhere from 90 to 100 days, 180 days. And again, you can talk to your mentors about how they do that, but I would say anywhere from 90 to 180 days in that spot. And then if you go down to <clears throat> number 11, You'll see some boxes under lockbox. And this is where the seller will authorize to either let you put on a lockbox or not put not put on a lockbox. And you want to make very certain that you understand the rules, lockbox rules, which again are posted at MLS. And that you never, ever, 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 ever give anybody a key or code to that information unless they are a licensed realtor and they have a purpose to be there. So for that, should I write up to seller? What's that? For that, should I write decision up to seller? Well, the use of the, the lock, lock, the lock box says that. They, they oh, have okay. to, yeah, they're, they're going to make that decision. Okay. Sometimes they don't want a lock box on there. <clears throat> I mean, usually, usually they do, but sometimes they don't. And we don't always put them on the door. Sometimes we put them on a gate or a fence or a chair or something. This depends. You don't always want it to bang and mess with a screen door or, or storm door or whatever. All right, number 13, seller's consent to disclose. They have to allow you to release the comps and all that stuff. If you look at those two uh, items, uh, one is to release comparable sales information. And I don't know why they wouldn't because it's kind of public anyway. And then convey to the other uh, agent the existence of multiple offers. They may or may not want you to share that information. And remember, you may not know this yet. I think I did discuss it with you last night, is that we work for the sellers. You work for the sellers and that their information is confidential. Remember the difference between buyers and sellers. With buyers, you don't have anything but maybe a human that you're connecting with. Until you actually have a property, there's nothing really to base anything on. Unless you have a, a buyer's agency agreement, which you should, and that gives you the connection to them. And then until you get an address, you don't have anything going on. But with a seller, it's completely different. So you have information, you have an address, and you have real people that are uh, connected to this address. So make sure you get those boxes checked. All right, next page. Under number nine, we talked about cameras and, and all that surveillance stuff last night. And... The seller does or doesn't have it. And then they say in here whether or not they're going to have them activated. Uh, and even if they tell you <laughs> they're not going to activate, just assume that they are. I don't think they're going to disconnect their ring doorbell. And if they have baby alarms connected to their infant's crib upstairs, they're not going to disconnect that either. So always assume that there are listening and recording devices in operation, even though they say, yeah, we're, you know, we won't use them, but they will. Okay. And then on the final page, uh, under number five, I want you to just circle that seven days. And that talks about the seller vacating the, the premises. And uh, which, which number did you say that was under? It's under yeah. five, number five. Or it says protection period. Oh, I have a different contract. I'm sorry. I may not match up to yours. Where okay. it says, just read where it says, seller gives buyer no less. <laughs> Did you find it? Not yet. There's like seven or eight uh, items in a list. On the last page, I see foreign sellers and amendments okay. on the middle um, page. Hold on. hold on. I think I...
somehow grabbed the wrong page. Uh, is the last page just seller's pay, a uh, signature page? Yeah, it's got two signature spots and the, or yeah, two signature spots and it says uh, exclusive right to sell listing contract, okay. foreign sellers and amendments. Okay, then you got what you need. Okay. Any questions on this? Nope. Okie dokie. All right. Buckle up. The first thing you want to do is at the very bottom of the contract is a revision date. And you want to make sure that you have the latest revision. What does yours say? For a revision date? Yeah, it says, does it say Columbus Realtors? Uh, it says at the top, it says yeah. Columbus MLS. Okay. Uh, let um, me see the front of your, let me see your front page. Okay, at the very bottom right hand corner. Is it little bitty print? Um, no. So the bottom right hand corner. Nothing. It's where conveyance is at. Okay. Does it say anything? I'm not talking about in the text. Um, oh, like at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, not, none of them. None this of them one just it? says, the very last page says Columbus Realtors 0823. Okay. Okay. And uh, Nessa, what does yours say? Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, uh, but I will have it in 30 minutes. Dave is printing it and bring it, bringing it to me. 30 minutes won't help you. We'll I know. Be, we'll be we'll be past. That's okay. There's a lot of information. Well, we'll do the best we can. Um, well, bottom line is right at the bottom. Just make a note. Make sure that the make sure it's the most current contract. And this goes for whether you're using it for for your buyers or whether you're receiving one. Uh, from a from uh, a buyer, a buyer's agent. If you're the listing agent, because believe it or not, in our wonderful market, there are brokers that are not up to par and not up to date. They think they're using. Uh, typically, if you're using um, Dot Loop or DocuSign, they're going to have the latest documents in there anyway. But there are a lot of little brokers and independent brokers, and they don't always work at the top of their game, okay? So if we start at the very top, you'll see there's a line that says premises address. It's on every page. And if you don't wanna to have to type that in every page when you're doing a contract, and believe me, it's a lot of work to put a contract together, you're gonna to want to automate that with an autofill feature in dot loop. So as you are, get are, to know- as you are, we get on the, are we on the purchase contract now? Yes, we are. Okay. So as you get to um, working on the purchase contract, we're all together, right? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> that feature, if you look at every page, you'll see that there's a line, address line at the top of every page. And it needs to be filled in. And the best way to do that is to make sure that your dot loop uh, is set up to autofill and you put in information once and it will autofill for you. It'll it'll fill in things like your name, the broker's name, the broker's number, all those things you're going to need in a contract. But let's just start with the property address to begin with. So as you go in uh, into your setting up a buyer packet and you print this doc, you, you start to work in this document, you'll be in dot loop. You'll pull in your, you know, the information on your um, buyers. And then you'll put the property address in. You'll input the address property. And then it'll ask you, do you want to autofill? And you're going to say yes. And you just, when you get trained on dot loop, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But I just want you to know that that gets filled in on every page. How much of these contracts should be written out in print on dot loop versus with pen, like in person, like in print? All of it's in dot loop. 
Okay. Yeah, nothing, nothing is in, in what they call uh, wet signatures. Yeah. Although, although, let me just say this, that there may be times when you're going to run into somebody who doesn't have a computer, whose computer's broken, who doesn't use a computer. Now you have to have, you have to have an email address from each participant. So if you have a husband and wife, a lot of times older couples, they'll share an email. Mm -hmm. You'll have to set up, they'll have to set up an email for each one of them for signatures, or okay. you're going to have to go get signatures at their house. And you're okay. going to have to do it every time you need a, an initial or a signature or whatever. So it's way easier to make sure that your clients, for you, it's not going to be a problem, Matt, because you're going to be dealing with youngins and they're yeah. probably going to be way savvy about it. They're going to have 10 emails each. <laughs> but I have, I have had handwritten contracts and I've had situations where I've had a widow that she just didn't have a computer and it's back and forth, back and forth to get it done. The way it goes. So hopefully they're not 50 miles away. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's move down the document. Um, on there, I want you to remember consumer guide is not dated the same as your contract. Why am I telling you that? Because I want you to have had the discussion with your buyers as we as we talked about long before you have to write up the contract. So um, at your first uh, meaningful meeting, that's when you should have had the, the uh, consumer guide signed and uh, you don't have any need to have that signed again, okay? Mm -hmm. You good? Yep. All right. Um, at the top of your form, here are the things that you also need to prepare <clears throat> to prepare an offer besides the contract. So if you just wanna write down in white at the top, uh, I just wrote across the top contract. Comma LBP, which is lead-based tape, if it's applicable, if it's uh, 78 or older. RPD, which is your residential property disclosure. Agency disclosure. And finally, a pre-approval letter, address specific, or proof of funds letter if it's cash. So that's everything you need for buying. When you want to submit an offer to the listing agent, those are the documents that you should have. Now, the reason I want you to have a highlighter because it'd be much easier for you. The things you absolutely have to have are the contract, the agency disclosure, and the pre-approval or proof of funds, those three documents. Because if you're in a in a tight schedule and you're in a chop chop situation to get a contract over to the other side. If they haven't signed the RPD yet, that's fine. The buyers, you can get that after the fact. You should have everything, but if you don't, um, you, you can just zip these over quickly so they have what they need. Don't forget that your pre-approval letter is to be address specific. Do you remember what you said about that? Uh, when we talked about it yesterday? Yep. Yeah, it was um, basically the pre-qualified isn't what you need. You need the pre-approval with the address for each property. Um, that way to get to the seller. the price on it? Nessa, do you remember? Yes, we have to have the, uh, the amount of how much they're approved for. Right, but but we don't want that them at the top of what they're approved for. In other words, we don't want them to say they're approved for four hundred if the if the price you're bidding on is three hundred, three fifty, three twenty five. We just want to know that the pre approval says that they can buy this address. Period. Right. Okay. 
because otherwise buyers, uh, sellers can use it against you in your bidding. Are you with me on that? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. All right, <clears throat> so going down this document, um, you should make a note to, if you or you can remember it, to go over the contract with the buyers ahead of the time of the offer. Somewhere early in your communication with them and you're making nice, nice and building your relationship, they should have an opportunity. Uh, now you can talk to your mentors and you can talk to the folks at Keller Williams and see if they want you to send them. I would never send a blank contract to anybody. I want to sit and go over it with them, but I'm not leaving it for them. Okay. Uh, now, if somebody says, well, I just send it out to them. Well, then that's okay. That's what they say. Uh, that's, that's their recommendation. It's not mine. So you want them to have time to review it. And the contract in and of itself gives them at least a minimum of three days with an attorney review. Whether anybody takes advantage of it or not, I don't know, but it's in the contract and we'll, I'll show you where it is. All right. So moving down the contract, if you look at, uh, yours may be a little different than what I have, but basically there should be a date line on the right. Does it say Columbus Realtors on the right side? Yeah, I see the date line right under it. Okay. So the contract starts on that date. So whatever that date is, and you need to know when did this contract start, that's you can make a note in that space, contract starts. Somewhere in the somewhere on the space or whatever, don't trust the MLS information. You're going to take everything that you possibly can from the auditor's uh, sheet. Now, I don't want to confuse you. So you have a contract date, you have a start date, okay? The, mm -hmm. I don't know, give me a minute. Day one is the first day after the contract sign. Day one, if you have to count days, it's day one after the contract date. That makes sense. Where's where's this at? I there's not a line for it. I'm just giving you information. Okay. When you have a contract, it, it'll talk about business days, this days, that days, and you have to start counting. So you have a, the date the contract starts, but the first day is the day after that the date of that contract. Does that make sense? Not the day of the contract, but the day after. So they have it's five days after it. It's day one. If you want to count day one, it's day one after the date of the contract signature or, or with the date, the contract starts on the date in the top right. But if you start counting days, day one, theoretically is the next day, not the day of, okay? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Okay. The information on those next lines, the um, county and the tax parcel is from the auditor. You can just put it on there, they're from auditor. And you put the address in just like it shows on the auditor site. The reason I want you to get the auditor is because sometimes when somebody puts in an address, uh, it could be wrong. And you want to know if it's street, lane, boulevard, creek, whatever. Okay. Uh, it's very important. So the address means a lot on the contract. The purchase price will be in numbers and 
have either of you written a check? Yeah. So you kind of write it like you write a check. You put the numbers and then you can put the text. Very, very important. The next box that says additional terms and conditions in a note in there, approved clauses only. Here's the thing. Let's let's let me before you write anything in there. Let me let's talk to you for a minute. When we get into trouble as agents, it's because we we get creative when we write. Words matter. Shall means something different than must. And when you're writing legal jargon, we're not supposed to write anything. We're just supposed to fill in lines, fill in blanks. So when we get into additional terms and conditions, that gets into a more hefty kind of uh, discussion about what we want, what the buyer wants, and this and that. So once you talk to your, your trainers, your mentors, and so on about how they want that filled in, but Keller Williams should have a, a long list, and they're probably in your dot loop, of approved clauses and there are clauses for virtually everything. So if there's a change or you need more time or you need something done, look at some of those clauses and see what matches. And if you need something special, then you're going to need to talk to somebody and you're going to have somebody with you who knows what they're doing for your first six anyway. But make sure that what goes in there is written well and written uh, as close to legal document as possible okay to so write approved clauses only in there i uh, approve clauses uh let me just read this to you anything that doesn't appear somewhere else in the contract is what goes in there so make sure that you're not writing something that's already included in the contract so you're going to have contingencies like possession appraisal gaps you know uh, items and, you know, escalation, different clauses, but there are clauses that are canned clauses that have already been approved that you can plug in there that will say what you want to say. And so you I, wrote, wrote, I, I, wrote, I wrote approved clauses and anything that doesn't already appear in the contract. There you go. Perfect. All right, um, under number three at the bottom, under financing, what dot loop does is it puts in these boxes, inside the boxes it will put initials. So if you have two buyers, it's gonna throw, it's gonna look for, for in each of these boxes, somebody to initial in there electronically. Well, if that's not the right box for them to initial, you're gonna have to kind of, uh, discount or to get rid of it and there is an option that says no one okay so if this is not a cash deal this first box is for cash only and so if you if you read it it'll say you know that you the initials are called for in there because you have a cash buyer if not you're going to have to remove the initials out of dot loop which you do as you go through the document and then you're going to go to the next page which is um you know initials in here if it's cash and if not you have to remove the initials out does that make sense yep. don't want to confuse you but there it, you'll be shown how to do that the next one is about financing and so if it's a finance then of course you're going to have uh the initials that are going to be in the boxes and you will be shown how to uh, where the initials are and how to get the initials and how to put them in there and all that. I, I don't do that. So just want you to, that's what that's for. And that's where those go. All right. Now the next one is um, lender. Pre, and it says pre-qual, but it, it's really for pre-approvals. All right. And it's self-explanatory, but that's when the credit has been approved and it should have been because you are, um, you know, you're, it's approved to the extent that they can they can make a purchase. All right, let me go down this. Uh, 
I've got notes on so many pages here. I've taken I've taken so many notes on this thing. I just want to make sure I give you everything. <coughs> All right. There's a form it right in here. It's going to say um, what kind of what kind of uh, look at three point two B, and you should put three days in there. It says if it's left blank, it's seven. So put three days in there. By the time you get to this point. They've already had their loan application, so it's a given. So three three days works in there. But a little bit further uh, down, uh, under A, it's going to say make formal, and it's going to say what type of, of loan you are telling the seller your buyer has. So right there it says conventional, FHA, VHA, and so on, or VA. Um, you have to pick one. So if you tell them in that box, that your buyer is going to have a conventional loan and they accept your offer and you come back, oh, I was just kidding, they're actually going to go FHA. Not a good situation. So be really sure that you're, and it should say on the pre-approval letter, it typically does, what type of loan they're approved for, whether it's VA, FHA, conventional, and so on. And I would recommend that when you can, Ness, if you've probably already done this, <laughs> is meet with at least two or three lenders and let them tell you the difference between the loans and what it means and uh, you know, kind of what your what your understanding is, okay? And then you can speak with authority as to what's going on. Now, can the buyer can the buyer change their mind and get a different type of loan or maybe into the process? The lender feels they'd be better served on an FHA if they came in on a conventional. That could happen. But that now has to be accepted and approved by the seller because the seller's thinking, I've got a conventional buyer here. I'm in good shape. And then somebody says, well, no, it's really an FHA buyer. Now the FHA wants them to fix some windows and fix some railing and do some painting and stuff like that. And the seller says, I'm not interested. So the seller can lock. If it changes, the seller has the option of accepting the different financing or not. So your buyer better be real sure when they enter into this. Um, In that case, if they decide they want to, like the seller's okay with them changing, would you have to write up a whole new contract or is it no, just- No, but you do an addendum. Okay. You have to have changes accepted by all parties in writing. And it's okay. generally done by an addendum. All right. Yep. So uh, just be very aware that when they commit in that spot to uh, that type of a loan, that's the type of loan you're going to be using. All right. Moving down the, uh, the double I, if you just want to make a note in the margin, that's called a good faith clause. Down under 3.2 loan commitment. You could put 24 in there. That works. You can talk to your trainers and mentors. What do they use? But typically we use 24. All right, we're going to page three. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, if you look at the big paragraph at the top, um, I would write somewhere at the top of that page, use a timeline. Because I talked to you about timelines yesterday the transaction timeline 
And the reason why I want you to get in the habit of using a timeline now while you're fairly new and are not real busy is because when you do get busy and you've got to orchestrate, you know, four or five different deals going on and different clients and different needs and all kinds of dates all over the place, it, it'll be very hard to manage. But if you use a transaction timeline, it keeps you on target. It keeps your your clients on target. It keeps the lenders on target, keeps the other side on target and so on. Everybody is aware of the dates that are needed and are mandated in the contract. Now, dates will, this is a, this is a, a fluid document, it changes. So if dates need to be changed, if times need to be changed, any circumstance that needs to be changed within the con within the context of the contract can be uh, changed by mutual acceptance and in writing. An amendment, for example, uh, an addendum. Okay. So it happens. Uh, people run out of time. They get sick. They go out of town. Uh, dates change. Dates are arbitrary and and can be changed. So just remember that. So the demand for financing evidence is pretty obvious. It talks about, you know, all the things that they they need to have uh, from the buyer and that and from the buyer's lender. So um, you have to remember to tell your buyers that the the lender needs everything ASAP when they ask for it. Okay. All right, let's see here. I've got notes I want to share. This uh, this paragraph, if you want to make a note, is actually key protection for the sellers because if the buyers don't perform, uh, the sellers are out. Okay? The sellers have the option of, of getting out. The contract has several outs for buyers and sellers. So if you go through the contract, when you go through the contract, I strongly urge you to have a highlighter. And one of the reasons I like you to do that is because I have many things here that are highlighted that should pop out at you. I can't do it this way because uh, Nessip doesn't have a contract and you don't have a highlighter. So, you know, what I want to give you tonight, I'll give you the essence of the uh, notes that you should have in here. And, uh, and then, you know, you can fill it in later uh, once you once you need to do that. Okay. Now you remember from Hondros, you remember from your schooling when they talked about taxes are paid in arrears and they're prorated. So if you look at four, number four, uh, just write a note in there, prorated at closing. And then that other white space that's in there somewhere, paid in arrears, just so you know. Prorated is when uh, it ends up getting split, like they get money back, right? For paying well, it's years prorated taxes. because it's, it depends on how much has already been paid and how much okay. is left over. For example, do you remember from Honduras when they said that it's a per diem, it's per day, it's X number of dollars per day, and it's based on 365 days? Yeah, I think I remember having to study for it because I saw it on a practice test for the correct. test and then I got a question like that. That is exactly correct. Yep. All right. So what I would tell you is if you make a note in there, typically what's happened is half of it was paid the previous year. And then there is a, a debit and a, and a credit, buyer, seller. Uh, seller gets credit for what's been paid and buyer uh pays for what the balance is. And it's done at the closing, uh, on the closing statement. Okay. Now, if you go down to the next line where it says these adjustments, do you have something down at the bottom? Uh, yeah, the bottom? see it. Okay. That's mainly on new builds. All right. It definitely doesn't really, uh, when I, and it's really pertains to 4.2. The community development charge, why don't you circle that? Community development charge is mainly in new build uh, communities. <clears throat> like Golf Village or Jerome Village or, you know, Pinnacle out in, in Grove City and so on. Um, 
So I wouldn't worry too much about that. At the bottom of your sheet, make a note that farms have an exclusion until development. If a if land is being farmed, the taxes are uh, deferred until it is not farmed. If land is being farmed, the taxes are deferred until until it's not farmed. Once if they're farming it, they're going to get some kind of a a break because they're farming it. <clears throat> All right, we're going to look at number four, which is the fun one. If you look at page four, you see the laundry list of stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So remember we talked yesterday about fixtures and personal property and all that stuff. Yeah. So this is a list of fixtures that must stay with the property. The expectation of the buyer is that, that these things, some all or whatever, are going to remain at the property. And um, a fixture, if you want to make a note, needs a tool to remove it. And if it's not a fixture that they want to keep, doesn't that get put on the consideration? Well, no, we don't we don't put any chattel, we don't put any personal property into the contract. That's done by a separate bill of sale. Okay. So if they want something, if they've negotiated the swing set and the owners have said, yeah, you know, you can buy the swing set. We're not leaving it, but you can buy it. And the buyers want to buy it, that's done by a separate bill of sale outside of closing. And that's to help yep. with uh, lending, right? It has like, to do so with it lending. Bring up... The lender is not going to loan on the swing set. Yeah. So it does not go on the contract. I made a note at the top that I think you should make a note of. Talk to your buyers about wanting too much stuff. And that's if you're out of the basement, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm in the kitchen now. <laughs> you didn't talk to get sellers about wanting too much. Yeah, uh, talk to buyers about wanting too much. What happens is less is more. If you start getting buyers that want this and want that and want this and want that, they're going to be up against people that are willing to say, I don't need this and that and this and that. I'm going to get my own things. And so I'm not going to make that part of the deal. So be very careful with buyers. And you have that discussion. Remember when you have your original conversations and you're talking about how things are going to go and what to expect, you know, all your expectations. And you're going to let them know, listen, if you want to have them throw in all this stuff, chances are you're going to get at the back of the pack if there are multiple offers. So if you ask for less, you got a chance of getting it, you know, more readily. Okay, make sense? Yep. Okay, so I just want that note to be there. Now, if you go into including um, what stays, I would make a note, call it out by brand. And I mean specifically the kitchen items. So let's say that you have in MLS, the listing agent has simply put stove, refrigerator, microwave, and dishwasher. You're going to see that a lot. In better homes, in luxury homes, they're going to say high-end stainless steel, or they're going to say what it is, if it's a Viking range or whatever. So you want to be sure that your buyers are getting what they're paying for, that they saw on their on their. Uh, love fest when they fell in love with the property. What happens is sellers have a habit of sometimes 
switching things and moving things out because they don't think anybody will notice. Hmm. Because the uh, buyer's agents weren't trained or smart enough to say, uh -uh, not so fast. We wanted a, a double door stainless steel, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, KitchenAid double door uh, refrigerator. We want the five burner KitchenAid, matching KitchenAid stove, five burner gas stove. We want the KitchenAid stainless steel microwave oven and we want the KitchenAid uh, dishwasher stainless steel. You have to be that specific because if that's what you saw and that's what your buyers want. Now, if, if the appliances are mismatched or they're so-so and the buyers don't care, then it's not a big deal. You still say stove, refrigerator, this, that, and the other thing so that they leave it there. But typically, I would call it out if it's good stuff. Call it out by brand and then you say as seen on and whatever date you were there showing it. Is it legal for the sellers to do that? Like switch nope. stuff out if you're not specific nope, with it? it? They do it. And they say, okay. well, come get me. You know, I'm on a, I'm on a truck to California. Come this makes me. a bunch of trouble, it sounds like. Oh, it's awful. And, and it, it, it just, here's the thing. <clears throat> um, it, it, it happens too frequently. If you don't, you've just got to call things out. Remember what I said to you about sellers. If they don't want to leave something, they need to take it down and replace it before they start showing it. Mm -hmm. Because once people see it, they want it or they expect that they're going to get it. Don't forget what I told you about the uh, mirrors in the in a bathroom. Because very often they're free hanging decorative mirrors that are lovely, but they pick them up off the hanger and take them with them. Okay. Yeah. So be very uh, specific about the uh, things. Now, make sure that you <clears throat> these are things that uh typically can be excluded and they people fight over them. basketball hoops because usually they're portable uh an outside outside place that you don't have to write it down but but remember and things that you want to know if they're leased do write this down under 5.2 you want to find out if these things are uh leased and that would be an alarm system water softener and propane tank. Those are things that are typically leased items. So if they're leased, you know, the leasing company's either gonna pick them up or you're gonna have to take over the lease or whatever. So you need to clarify that before you write up your contract so that all these things are clearly spelled out, okay? I told you yesterday, and you can write it again here, uh, just let your clients know there's no perfect home and that when they have the inspection, they're looking for, and we can write it in here, health, safety, mechanical, structural, and then we added roof and windows because they're high ticket items. Those are the things we're looking for. If we got problems with those, you know, we want to make sure that that, that gets uh, squared away. And you must, you can make a note, you must uh, refer or recommend three inspectors. We so yes, yesterday you told us that like a new roof is something in the last five years. What is considered a really old roof? Hmm. They have 30-year roofs, they have 20-year roofs, they have 50-year roofs, they have okay, all kinds so of roofs. It just depends on who made it then? How old it is and, and whether it's been hit by hail, what, you know, if it's been damaged or whatever. Okay. You know, kind of what the roof, what the, what the uh, life is left in it, how much life is really left. <clears throat> okay? Yep. I think that's all I've got for you on that page. Um, <clears throat> okay. 
page, where are we? Page five, right? Uh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> now, at the top of page five, there's a, there's a, a blank line, right? Mm -hmm. And the uh, typical days in there would be five. <clears throat> and um, you either need a request to remedy. So I would make a note there, need RTR or termination. That means that that if if the buyers do not want to have an inspection, that they need to have a waiver. They need to uh, terminate that request by use of a form that says that we waive our right to have an inspection. Do not recommend it. Always recommend that your buyers have an inspection. Otherwise, they have to sign a waiver that they signed off on it. There are lots of those floating around where buyers gave up their right to have inspections a couple years ago because they because it was so competitive and they're regretting it now because they're finding all kinds of stuff they should have found before they bought it. But it's, you know, if, if, you're, if you're the seller and if you're getting two offers, one is requesting a inspection an inspection and the other one is not you know you'll use the you'll accept the one if everything else is equal you'll you know the sellers will accept the one that doesn't require inspection it, so well it's a very rare instance anymore where buyers are waiving their right to inspection but they are waiving their right to our remedies they'll give up their right to have the, the seller pay for remedies and fix things but they're not going to give up their right to know what's wrong with the place. Well, they were probably only doing that just because of uh, how competitive the market was, right? Well, like when were. people were bidding way over the listing price and stuff. They were. The houses. But, but you, you've got to be at some point. I mean, if you feel, if you feel that confident that you can fix anything, let's say some, let's say there's a couple or a parent or something. They're very handy. And mm -hmm. fixing things is not a big deal. Now, to pay for fixing things is is a big deal. But materials are still materials. There's still condition. I mean, if you're in a newer home, <clears throat> chances are you're not going to run into something really awful. You might. But let's say there was something catastrophic that happened in there. If you don't have an inspection, you're on your own. And you're not going to be able to, to go back because you've waived your right to do it. So... Having an inspection, and more people are doing that for sure, is they're not waiving their right to inspection because there's so much brouhaha going on now with people that did that. So waive your right to remedies, but not to inspections. So when they waive their right to remedies, but still get an inspection, like when the inspection brings stuff uh, into question that would need fixed, they can just uh, pull their contract, right? Because they did the inspection found things that would make them not want to buy it? Possibly. Okay. There's an escape hatch for, it depends on the circumstances. They can waive their right to remedies, but if they find something that structurally, you know, the house is going to cave in, they have no reason to buy that house. Yeah. So again, we talked about health, safety, mechanical, and structural. And if any of those show up, those are expensive. And they are scary. They can harm their family. So they would have no obligation to go through with the, you know, with the uh, with the sale. It's they're not breaching anything. They're not saying, I, I don't want to buy this because I just, you know, don't don't like it anymore. They're saying there's something that can harm my family and the seller's not willing to do it. Now, <clears throat> all of that ebbs and flows. A seller can stand on his ear and say, I'm not fixing anything. <clears throat> but here's the problem. Let's say let's say a seller says, I'm listing my property and I'm going to list it as is and I'm not going to do any repairs. And they put that into their listing agreement and you put that in MLS. Sold as is, seller not willing to make any repairs. Property as, as is condition. Okay. So you go and you decide that you're making an offer and you're going to have an inspection. 
we already know the seller's not going to do anything. Okay, but we're going to pay for an inspection and have it. Oh my gosh, look at that. We've got bowed walls in the basement and the, the basement's going to cave in. Not acceptable. Mr. Seller, are you going to fix the cellar? Are you going to fix the basement? Nope. Okay, we're going to walk. Well, let's negotiate. Let's let's take this ready, willing, and able buyer that gave me a really good price for my property, that has really good credit, that has really good terms. I can move when I want to. I can, I can get the heck out of here. And I've got to come to some terms with, I either do it for this buyer or I let this buyer walk and I have to do it for the next buyer whose terms may not be anywhere close to the good terms I have right now. So think about it. If you're Mr. Stubborn Seller, wouldn't you rather negotiate with a ready, willing, and able buyer that's in really good shape with you right now and come to some conclusion, either a reduced price or something that's going to pacify both sides, negotiate it through, and make it work? Does that not make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. Um, I have a question, Carol. Sure. Let's say you're the seller. I'm the buyer. I come into your house. I, I read the listing uh, description and there is nothing about leak in the basement, for example. And I come in as a buyer and I see the leak and I'm like, okay, are you going to, you know, I'm asking the seller, are you going to fix it? And the seller says no. So, and I don't buy the property, right? Okay. So I walk away. Does the seller have to, now it's not a latent defect. It's a known defect. Does the seller have to disclose that for the next buyer or potential buyer who's interested? Now, not if he fixes you know. it. Not if he fixes it and it doesn't leak anymore. But if it doesn't, if he doesn't fix it, then. Ah, if it's still leaking, the next buyer is going to see it. And yes, he has to disclose it. And if he doesn't want to disclose it, you do. Okay. When you get into moral disputes like that, are you a bit like able to uh, stop working with the seller if he's like just wanting to like lie about the property and stuff like that? Absolutely. Okay. You can fire a client anytime you want. Okay. And I have, and you should. Anytime they test your moral uh, capabilities and, and put you in a compromising position, walk away. Just say, I, I am, I am. I am not the person you think I am to to do this. Um, I just don't think I can represent you properly. Be happy to give you somebody else, refer you to someone else, or I'm just going to walk away and they're going, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, I'll take care of it. Just hold on. So don't compromise your personal integrity. Yeah, well, that's what I was getting at, just because, like, I mean, it's all about reputation with the, with this type of career, you know? You, like, make yourself look bad to that buyer and then, that buyer is going to tell people you're bad. You know what I mean? So Well, never compromise your ethics, your morals, your integrity. Remember I talked to you, I think the first night or we talked about core values mm -hmm. and that's your driving force. If you compromise that, you've got nothing. Look, yeah. people are going to try to push your buttons and they're going to try to do, they're not going to fill out the RPD uh, completely. They're going to lie and cheat and do whatever what they can do sometimes. And when they're caught doing it, they have to make it right or you can walk away. And then you have an obligation to uh, to um, disclose. You know, lack of disclosure is a big reason for lawsuits. Yeah. And uh, also you have agents that will deliberately hide something because they want the sale. That's, that's a terrible thing to do. <clears throat> so at some point you're going to get caught. Yeah. So best to fire the client and walk away. It, you'll find you, I, when I have classes with seasoned agents and I ask them, how many of you fired a client? And a lot of hands go up. And I said, how did that feel? And they all said, wonderful. It just felt wonderful. Because they got out from under a really bad situation. Okay. Any other questions? Good questions. Thank you. Uh, where are we on page five? Yep. I think we're on page yeah. five. All right. Um, so we talked about the remedy period. Uh, typically it's three days now. Page six. Okay. <clears throat> Page 
We're looking at the page where it says notice of termination, right? In the middle. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> up in the space at the top left, in that white space, it says white space and then has or in the middle, the first one. Just yep. write a note in there, mandatory send the full report. Okay, and that means that you're going to send the full report um, to the seller. So that they have a full reference as to, you know, just don't send highlights or let's send them the report and let them look at it. All right, very important. Now we're down at the bottom where it says condominiums. <clears throat> this is going to be what we've talked about. <clears throat> we've talked about <clears throat> quite a bit the that condos are a different animal completely. So when you're the buyer's agent, um, you want to make sure, do you remember what I told you last night about condos need to be, for an FHA or VA buyer, they need to be what? I remember talking about it, but I forget what it was. <laughs> Warrantable or conforming. Okay, so right in that spot, condos to be warrantable or conforming for FHA and VA. Now, I've got some other notes for you to make around the condos that are really important. You don't want to have a situation with a buyer who wants to buy a condo and maybe they're a vet and they you find a warrantable condo, but you can't fly any flags there. You can't fly anything but an American flag. And maybe they want to fly an MIA or they want to fly a don't tread on me or they want to fly something there and they can't. And maybe they've got an 80 pound golden retriever named Bubba and they want Bubba to live with them and they've got a big four by truck. Oh my God, we got problems. So the condo association docs say, you can't have a truck. You can't park the truck in the driveway. You can't put anything up with an American flag and you certainly can't have more than a 10 pound dog. That is obviously not the apartment or condo for your client. Be very careful about what you show them <clears throat> match it up to what their needs are and what they're looking for because you're going to waste a whole lot of time and get them really frustrated if you can't take them to where they need to be. Okay? <clears throat> so be careful about what the condo docs will allow. You can always ask the listing agent. They may not know, but you can always ask. But the seller needs to provide the listing docs. It's in the contract. And they only have a week to do it or whatever it is that's spelled out in the uh, in the contract, in the listing agreement. Okay? Yep. So the other thing that you want to know about the condos before you jump in with both feet is are there any pending, write this down, any pending special assessments? That means that when Mr. and Mrs. Buyer get in and get settled, three months later, they're going to get hit with a big stick for uh, a new roof they're putting on. And it's gonna be 500 a month, every unit. That would not be happy time. So make sure you understand if there are any pending assessments. And you also wanna make sure that the condo has at least two years a reserve in their bank account. We don't want to go into an, a situation in a condo where they're bankrupt or darn near. So Do the lenders to... put into consideration the HOA fees when they Absolutely. write up a loan? Okay. Well, the HOA fees, <clears throat> you could have those in a in a subdivision. You could have, you know, POA fees, uh, condo fees. And yes, that is something that the lender is going to take into consideration in the bottom line payment of the buyers. Can they afford a thousand dollar a month mortgage and a three hundred dollar a month condo fee? 
plus taxes and insurance and everything else. Do they use the same the same method as they do for a normal mortgage, like the 36% and 28%? Ask them. Okay. I don't know what they're using now. The, the criteria would be similar in terms of the job and debt to income ratio and things like that, but I can't give you exacts. I don't okay. know. Okay, moving along. Any questions on condos? Okie dokie. Page seven. Lots of notes on page seven. All righty. <laughs> All right, let's look down, let's see, on the warranties. Um, a home warranty, see where it says home warranty? Let's talk about that for a minute. There are numerous vendors affiliates that sell home warranties. Some are good, some are awful. There's a gentleman that sells them for, his name is Dwight Pig. If you haven't met Dwight yet, he's a super guy. He comes in the office, he'll buy you lunch, he'll, he'll sit and schmooze with you. And um, he has a good program. And uh, you might want to get to know him. But when you're dealing with older properties, you might want to talk to uh, the seller about buying an extended warranty, an extended home warranty to put on the property as soon as it as soon as it goes in contract, because most of them will cover the seller and the warrant the appliances and everything while the seller is still there. On day of closing, it refers to the buyer for the next year. The seller will pay for it out of the seller's proceeds. So they don't even have to cut a check until closing. It's going to be five or $600 typically, and it's well worth it to have that extra protection because just like anything else, the minute you go in contract, the refrigerator door falls off, the air conditioner stops working, you know, uh, the water heater blows up and so on. So it's a good investment if you can get the seller to, to say, yeah, I'll take it because it happens that it will cover them. Nothing, no cash out of pocket and it's a good product. So think about that um, for older older properties. <laughs> and also, it's a very, very good tool that sellers use to entice buyers. Not that there's any shortage of buyers for the existing property. We're in a different marketplace now. But it does help older uh, older property sellers to make their property more inviting because it gives the buyers reassurance that, that they're covered mostly uh, if something goes wrong, you know, uh, during the time that they're there. Okay. Uh, let's see, make sure. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're using the uh, information from the auditor because you want to make sure the seller's information is correct. We've already talked about that. Um, the title insurance in this market is generally paid for by the seller. So down under eight point, I'm sorry, under nine, you could put a note, title insurance generally paid by the seller. Now, here's a little caveat when you get done. If the seller <clears throat> has been in their property for less than 10 years and can get his hands on the title policy, he's entitled to a discount typically with the title company even if it wasn't the same title company that closed on it before. You with me? So if so, the seller has been there less than 10 years, they're entitled to a discount? Probably. They, they might be, and I would say might, might be entitled to a discount if they can get their hands on their closing documents 
when they bought the property because and it will save them some money and they'll appreciate that you told them that. and it doesn't matter whether it's the same title company or not if they can get the title a discount on title insurance yeah okay In the space under title insurance somewhere, write common name search. If you're dealing with if you're dealing with um, buyers that have a common name, Joe Smith, Joseph Smith, Mary Davis, whatever, uh, Jose Garcia. Um, well, you know, I mean, the common names in their yeah. Ethnicity, Mr. Patel, or Patels are like Smith. So if you think about this, the title does the search, but don't panic. And the buyer shouldn't panic if they come back that there are liens against them because they have to figure out which Mr. Smith, which Mr. Patel, which Mr. Garcia this pertains to. And it could take a while. So you should ask them, do you have any pending liens? Do you have anything? And you can ask them that right up front when you have the discussion about making an offer. There'll be a title search and you have a pretty common name. Do you have any known liens pending against you that you're aware of? And they say, absolutely not. They say, well, I thought I paid such and such. Maybe that's your guy. But you want to make sure that the title company, uh, when they do that search, they're going to come up with something probably. So make your clients aware that that could happen just because they have a pretty common name. Do they tell us uh, what type of lien lien that is, like yeah. tax lien or? They'll say if it's a tax or, lien or a mechanics lien or whatever. Or sure. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say the property has a lien. How, how is that resolved? The seller has, has to, to be, it has to be satisfied. Pay, and can they pay at the closing on their expense? Has to be paid prior to closing. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. thank you. Yes, sir. You betcha. All right, we're on page nine. Guys, nice gone. All right. <clears throat> Title insurance, um, under 9.3, I have a note. It may be different now, but title insurance is roughly $6 per 1,000. Oh, the SS value, yeah. Um, okay. All right. Under page nine, you see all those little boxes at the bottom. First, go to earnest money number 12. And uh, I would make a note above earnest money in that white space. If held by the title company, you may need a separate clause. Now, I don't know if Keller Williams, uh, Greater Columbus, do you know, Nessa, when you have earnest money, do you bring it to the brokerage or does it go to the title company? You bring it to the brokerage. Okay. Yeah. Then, then don't worry about it. But you're... Typically, earnest money is about $1,000, uh, 1%, I'm sorry, 1% of the list price is typical. But there's no typical anymore. And earnest money is all over the map. So that's a discussion you're going to have to have uh, with, your, with your clients as to what they're comfortable doing. 
And that I can't tell you. And you got to make sure that it's refundable if the buyer backs out. Sometimes the sellers want to keep it no matter what. And maybe and maybe that's the way it was written. Exactly. So it has to be on the contract that it could happen. It could yeah. happen. It could happen. Absolutely. Um all right. Uh again, those little boxes are for initials. And by the way, make a note under earnest money that earnest money is negotiable. And I also put in there, may write a non-refundable earnest money or pay directly to the seller. So you can play with the earnest money as a carrot to dangle in front of a seller. They have written, they, buyers have written checks directly to the seller, 5,000, 10,000 non-refundable. I'll pay you right now, whether I take it or I leave it. You pick me and I'll write you a $10,000 check right now. And it's yours, win, lose, or draw. I'm that comfortable that I'm going to be buying your house. So it's <laughs> it's out there. It's out there. Okay? I did it. What's that? I, I did put 10000 actually as earnest money just in order to get my house. I hear you. You did that? Yeah. Well, but you were confident. I was confident, but I was afraid that someone else would come in and buy the property. Like, But you got it, right? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Well, now you know how to negotiate. You know you know what it's going to take. I mean, you've been there, done that, right? Yeah. All right. Um, the earnest money block on page 10. You don't accept any earnest money after the contract's accepted it's a done deal <clears throat> and then um you, you don't want copies don't take a copy a photocopy of their check that shouldn't be floating around anywhere Down on number E, <clears throat> under 12E, if there's a dispute and the buyer and seller separate, there needs to be a termination and a mutual release. If the buyer and seller separate, there needs to be a termination yeah. and mutual and release. Mutual release. Yep. Okay, page eleven. Under number 13, you already have it at the bottom of the page on the next, uh, before it says need a mutual release. And then um, All right, go to 13.6 and make this note. The date of acceptance, there's always confusion about the date of acceptance. So this is date of acceptance. When the last party signs and the contract is delivered. 
when the last party signs and the contract is delivered. Because date of acceptance is very important in the legal uh, back and forth and so on. Okay. Now, if you see down below 13.7 FERPTA, Yep. All right. So if you have a buyer <clears throat> that is from another country, that is the owner, they have to declare that they are a foreign, this will explain it to you, and they will owe income tax at closing, and that income tax is overseen, and the buyer is responsible to make sure that that income tax is paid on that transaction. Don't ask me why. I don't know why the buyer is involved, but it is. But I want you to make sure you read that FERPTA and that you understand what's going on there. Because I had a situation where I was aware of a, a couple. He was from another country. Um, so he was a foreign investor. And they were about to sell. And he had to pay the taxes on the property. He said, well, I'm just going to put my house in my wife's name. <coughs> and then I don't have to pay it. <coughs> No, he couldn't do that. <coughs> Excuse me. So be careful. Just make sure you know what you're dealing with. That action, the FERTA recognition and what's going on, needs to be discussed with the title company. They should be able to take care of it. But that's where the responsibility to clarify all that uh, falls really with the title company. But I want you to be aware of what it is in case you're dealing with, you know, and you can, you've got to ask these questions. That's why I want you to have that cheat sheet so that you can ask good questions when you're meeting with buyers and stuff. And they'll tell you they're they're not married and they are married and they're divorced and they've got this running battle going with the other side. And, you know, now they need dower, they need signatures, and it's a mess. So kind of understand what you're dealing with uh, before you get into it, okay? You'll have oversight and you'll have help with your mentors, but I just want you to be aware that when you run into these things, it's a bell's going to go off and you're going, oh yeah, Carol talked about that. Carol talked about that. Okay. This is not meant for you to remember everything because you won't. And there's no expectation of you doing that. All right. Page 12. Page 12. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. Page 12. If you uh, look at the bottom under 14.4, the second paragraph, the buyer acknowledges. Uh, I put a note in there, buyers should look up schools too. They're going to ask you about safe neighborhoods and this and that. And they, we don't do that for them. They have to do it. And they should look up the schools they're interested in too. Okay. All right. This is important stuff. Really important stuff. Page 13. Um... The first box, the first note at the top, closing, on or before, right in that line, date, comma, days, comma, time of day. Are we both on page 13? We should be. What have you got? So mine starts, it says, final verification of condition. Okay, go beyond that. To the next page? Right. It's, 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 well, no, all right. If you're, if you're final verification, that's, okay, keep going. Um, possession, debris, and personal property, duration of offer. Okay, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> Let 
we're in the same place. Forget the page number. Do you see where it says closing? I'm looking for it. Which section does it say closing under? Under closing and possession should be number 15. Oh, mine must have cut off weird or something. Okay. It's all right. Yeah, because mine's on the previous page. Okay. <laughs> I'm all good. I got it. So, closing, and if you had a highlighter on or before, but don't want you to put date, days, and time of day, it's very important that that be put in there. Here's what happens a lot of times. <clears throat> Buyers and sellers are at the closing table, or they're not. Let's say the buyer goes in. At one time, the seller goes in. Seller goes in in the morning, signs off everything. And then the buyers go in <clears throat> in the afternoon. <clears throat> and <clears throat> they, uh, they have their car full of stuff. And they think just because the seller signed and they've signed, that the house is theirs and they can boogie over to the house and start offloading in the garage. Maybe not. It depends on what the closing time of day is. Maybe the seller has until 8 o'clock p.m. or 9 o'clock p.m. or midnight. It's very important to, to remember that that's what's going to, to dictate. Now, <clears throat> the exact, uh, the, the typically a, a uh, transaction is closed. <laughs> at funding and the exact time of day. If you look at 15.3 possession, when can the buyer have possession? At funding, meaning the seller's been paid and whatever time the contract says it should be. So the buyer may have to wait to offload their stuff. Maybe the seller has possession until the next day. It's not the buyer's house just because they sign papers. If the contract says that the seller has possession the next day because the movers are coming, then that's already been determined in the contract. So you got to figure out what's what's real here, what's really happened, you know, so that you can determine that. <clears throat> okay, does that make sense? So um the final verification, the walkthrough, it typically says two days already in here, but it's got to be 48 hours for VA and FHA. So make a note in there, must be 48 hours. The walkthrough has to be 48 hours for VA and FHA. This page is really a sticky wicket. Make sure that you get this right. And I know you will because you'll have oversight. Now, under duration of offer, we'll just talk about this for a minute. It should be 24 hours or less. It depends on what's going on, but you should always, always, always call the listing agent and have a nice conversation with him or her about <clears throat> what is the expectation and the needs of the seller. What would they like to see? What is important to them? Maybe they need possession after closing. Maybe they need a short, a short window because they want to move on quickly. Find out what's important to them. And you can construct, if you can, if you've got buyers that are flexible, you can construct your offer to match up with what their needs are. But you have an opportunity to make nice, nice with a listing agent and thank them and always let them know that you are sending an offer and that you, and please ask them to let you know when they've received the offer and then make nice, nice back and forth. It's very important to know that communication has been sent and received. Just don't assume 
if you're gonna if you're gonna write an offer <laughs> and you don't communicate with a listing agent, that's a very bad way to do business. You should always try to communicate and set up a relationship with the co-op. Now, here's the other thing. Let's say you make an offer and your offer gets rejected. It may not be the end of the day. You should find out from your buyers and you should find out from the listing agent if they would take a backup offer because deals fall apart all the time, every day. So if your client doesn't get it this go round and they really love the house, they can still look at property. They can still go out. They can still make another offer somewhere. This offer is nowhere. It's just a backup offer is just sitting there in a position. And if they found another house that they make an offer on, they can rescind. They can pull back and just say, we're pulling back our offer, taking it off the table. So let's say I made an offer. You're the seller. You rejected my offer. And as a buyer, I thought about it. You know, can I make another offer on the same house? Can I? No, because they weren't. No, because they've already made an accepted. They've made an accepted an offer. So They're let's in, say they didn't accept any offer. I still like. Oh sure, as long as the offer's still open. Okay. But typically, the reason your offer has been rejected is because they've accepted another offer. Got it. And they're already in contract. Now, it doesn't mean that's in cement. It just means they've accepted another offer. What if they have an inspection and there's something this buyer doesn't like, but your buyer may be willing to accept it? Okay. And maybe maybe they had a really hard decision between your offer and the other <laughs> offer, and it was a toss-up, and they they just went because this lender was better. It was that It was that skinny. So they found out that this isn't all working out and this buyer flew the coop. Now they want you to be in backup position, but you already said we want to be in backup position. So it's always good to ask a seller if they'll accept a backup offer and ask a buyer if they're willing to make a backup offer. Okay. Give you another bite at the apple. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> The 24 hours or less should be short but reasonable time frame. You really should discuss again, discuss with the listing agent what is a reasonable time frame. We would really want to be in contention. We don't want to get lost in the shuffle here, but we want to be what's we want to do what's fair to the seller. Maybe, maybe you're stuck at 10 o'clock at night. It happens 10, 11 o'clock at night. And They've called for highest and best offer by 10 o'clock and you just scooped in under the thing. So what's reasonable for your offer to be looked at? Maybe it's maybe it's noon the following day. Maybe it's three o'clock the following day. Follow what I'm saying? But you should ask that of the, when is he going to present all the offers to the seller? Because you definitely want to be in the running. <clears throat> so what's going to work best? You know, what are the conditions that are going to work best? Now, there are clauses in that white space at the bottom. Clauses like, and I'm gonna give you the clauses. There are certain clauses because when you're dealing back and forth with buyers and sellers, for example, for example, possession, maybe you have a seller who really needs to say there, maybe the wife's pregnant and they bought another house and they don't wanna move twice. So they wanna stay in it a couple of weeks or maybe the movers aren't coming for a couple of weeks and your buyers are flexible they're they're fine they can flex up for a couple of weeks and so there are clauses for possession whether it's just possession because it could be anything uh whether there's rent involved so there's renters insurance okay and it's going to depend upon the time and the circumstances and then seller's occupancy so this all involves seller's occupancy after closing, which means they would want to have probably renter's insurance and uh, whatever those clauses say. Very, very, um, for me, I find it to be a very dangerous situation. I don't want a seller in their house after it closes. I want them the heck out. If I'm the buyer's agent, 
I want my buyers in there for all kinds of reasons. What if there's a hailstorm? What if there's a fire? What if something goes kaput? You know? Uh -huh. And who caused it? And then there's a back and forth and it's just nasty and messy. It's just amazing. So I like clean, clean deals, as clean as they can be. So think about that. There's a lot to process in terms of what you're dealing with. Now, I want to go to the signature page. This is very important. I want both sides filled out. Lazy, untrained agents do not fill out the right side. You will. Okay. Everything that you need, everything that you need is in MLS or in your file. Now, the, the left side pertains to your agency, your brokerage. The right side pertains to the seller. And if you see here, I've got I've got the broker number plugged in. Remember when I asked you to put it into your phone? <clears throat> can I can I see your paper? It's the last page. So is mine's mine looks like it's split up different, I thought. It's like no. one side no? Okay. I just want to make sure because one side it's buyer <laughs> and the other side seller. You said something about <laughs> one side is broker. If you look at the top, it says undersigned buyer. Yeah. And the other side says undersigned seller. Okay. So if you go down to brokerage, you typically don't fill out anything where the attorney is because there's generally no attorney. We don't do fax numbers anymore. And this will pretty much autofill the buyers. You're, you have the buyers. This is your, your product. So, and then you're going to fill in, in dot loop, you're going to go over and fill in the seller's information from the auditors. Whoever the seller is on the deed, whatever it says, it could be a trust. It could be a corporation. It could be a partnership. It could be a whole lot of stuff. Well, whoever the seller is on the deed. And then down at the bottom, it says brokerage and agent and all that. That's the seller's representation. That should be shown somewhere in MLS. On the listing, on the MLS sheet, you'll see who the listing agent is, what the brokerage is, what the broker number is. All the information you need from there is there. Fill it in so that both sides are filled in. Because once you fill out this document, and it's fully signed and you are in contract, you want to get this immediately to the lender. A copy of the contract will go immediately to the lender. And you can call the lender and say, hey, I'm writing a contract. I'll send you the, I'll send you the contract as soon as it's fully signed. Okay. And then you make sure you fill out a transaction timeline so that you have all the information from this, uh, from the contract that you need for the transaction timeline. And then you send a copy of that to the lender. You'll send it to the co-oping agent, the listing agent. Okay. And you'll send it to your buyers. And hopefully the uh, listing agent will send it to their sellers. And what you want is you want the listing agent to look at it and just say, please look at the transaction timeline. Do you agree with it? Do it in writing You do it by an email or a text. And they'll say, yeah, looks good to me. Now they've got their information. You've got your information. So everybody can stay in sync and stay on top of it to be in contract. So that nobody's, nobody's breaching, nobody's in violation. Now, as you get through the contract and you start to go through the process, the loan process, the appraisal process, the inspection process are all going on. Everybody's doing their part. <clears throat> and uh, if there are changes that are needed, somebody needs more time, somebody needs less time. Maybe you got the clear to close from the lender earlier than you planned. Let's say you had closing on or before January 31st, but they're clear to close on January 20th. So if the buyer agrees and the seller agrees that closing will be on January 20th, you've just moved it up by 11 days, which is possible. Or let's say you can't close until February 5th. So you need all of these change documents signed by all parties to change the dates going forward.
Any questions? It's very, very straightforward. Um, all of these things will be very helpful to you. What I want you to do, I want you to look at this. If you see this, these yeah. are all amendments, different forms. There's all kinds of stuff in here that I have, our change, change documents. And you're probably going to need a lot of them, but you're going to have all of those documents in dot loop. You're going to have a complete uh, hand holding, I hope, and I'm sure, with a Keller Williams mentor trainer. Somebody's going to guide you and direct you um, in your in your efforts to write your contracts. You'll be somebody that you can reach out to and contact that will help you with the verbiage, with the dates and times, but you have at least a template, a, a pattern to look at to at least start. And you need to learn how to use dot loop, how to do your contracts. I beg of you, I beg of you to put in as soon as you can, take the time to put in a, I talked to you about it yesterday, a uh, pretend buy and a pretend list so that you've gone through all of this in reality. And so you're familiar with it. It will be far less stressful and far less aggravating if you do that and do it ahead of time. <clears throat> so uh, your mess up, you're more than halfway there. Mac, you really get it. You've really got a good brain and you really have understood all of the training and all the things that we're giving you. You've asked really good questions. You may be young, but you're very smart and you've got a real brain for this. And Thank also you. you're motivated. Please remember to leave, Jen. Please remember to build your database. Please hear my voice in your ears reminding you uh, that you've got to leave, Jen, and you've got to build your database. I will not let you down. Those two things are going to carry you and get you a great income. But it's your drive and your motivation. You've got to have a business plan. You've got to work on your GPS, your goals, your priorities, and your strategies. And you've got to you've got to work your plan. It just has to happen. And follow the Keller Williams systems and tools that you'll be given. They work. They work. And please, for heaven's sake, show up at trainings. Take the time to go to meetings and go to training. It is so frustrating for me and frustrating for management to put all these wonderful things in front of agents and they blow it off and they wonder why they don't succeed and why they fail. And I just can't tell you enough. I have what I've just trained you in. I can do. I sat through every uh, contract class that my broker taught when I was at Keller Williams over and over and over and I kept making notes because I heard things different each time and I thought what a great idea because we all have different ideas and different things work and when you take the best of the best and she was in business for 45 years she had twice as much under her belt as I did and I still learn stuff so when you have the opportunity to get into training and to learn it take advantage of it your free trainings, your free CEs, those are things that are going to drive you and motivate you and get you to where you need to be. Read the red Absolutely. book. Read the, the, red the red book. book. That's the red okay. Book. I, I think I have that book. I can read that. And buy yourself a highlighter. If I were in the class, I would have given you one. I would have given you one of these too. Is that a highlighter? No, that's it's a, my pen. Oh, I was about to say, that's a weird looking highlighter. <laughs> not getting it. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, one of these days you'll be in another class, maybe a core class that I teach or whatever, and you'll get one of those. And I'll get to you guys again. But the point is, look, you are, you're in a wonderful bro a brokerage with great leadership and great training. And it's on you now. The torch is passed to you. You've been through the fast track. The, the torch is passed to you to take all of this and remember what you can, you won't remember it all, but it will start to come to you as you get into additional time and trainings with your mentors and, and the other folks there. Things will start to ring a bell and that's all we can ask. But your motivation 
your self-discipline is really what's going to get you successful or not. Definitely. Is there anything I can help you with? Anything that you have a question of? Anything that I gave you and you didn't quite understand or need more of? I feel like there probably is, but I can't think of it. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I probably forgot something down the road. Okay. I'm going to ask you for your takeaways, your ahas. If you can, if you can think back now over the last week and think about the ahas, the things that, that really stood out to you overall, if you can remember. One thing that I remember the most, it was when we were going over those bold laws with all those quotes. And um, the, the thing you said to me was, a thousand no's is worth one yes. And I guess I kind of put it in my head that it's, it's worth uh, getting over the fear of talking to people and stuff and the fear of rejection, you know, and just getting past that. What do they mean to you? Yeah, exactly. Do, are they going to change your life one iota with a no? No. It's just going to make you stronger because you're going to be closer to a yes. Yeah, So we'll absolutely. Thank you. But what would you might want to know is, so what is, you know, can you explain to me why you know, can you explain to me why you said no? It would be very helpful to me if you could let me know. Maybe it's not, maybe it's a timing, maybe it's personal situation, maybe it's me, whatever. Yeah. But it would be very helpful. And I would deeply appreciate it if you could just tell me your reason for no. And I, I would, mm -hmm. I would accept that. For sure. Nothing wrong with asking and no's turn into yeses. Yeah. So, uh, okay, you remember your business plan. You remember all the different, you remember be the source of the source. You remember all this kind of stuff, right? Don't yep. overstep, stay in your lane, do what you can do and uh, just work on the things that you, you're already good at stuff. So just continue to be better at it and learn your craft and, and you'll get it for sure. Definitely. All right. Nessip, anything I can help you with? Your ahas, your takeaways, things that you remember, and you yeah, know. I think, you know, during these days, like oh, I think the the most important thing is to me, you know, the database, your lead generation, and that's the foundation I think of this business. And I can learn the contracts. Well, luckily I have my partner is a real realtor. So I can ask them if I have any questions. Yeah. And um, Keller Williams, of course, there are great people there. Um, so it starts from me. If I don't take the action, no one else will. So but it's true. Yeah. Nobody's going to write you a check. Guys, don't forget to have a separate bank account. Don't yeah. forget you're in a real business and you're be very careful about keeping your receipts and tracking your expenses. Right now, you've got all expenses. Until you have income, all you've got is out. And if you're going to want to, right now, what you're really doing is you're really loaning your business money. You're paying for stuff out of your pocket for your business. But at some point, you're going to want to be reimbursed. Yeah. So make sure that you keep a receipt and keep track of everything that's going on. You're I'm actually with, meeting that? Sunday. I'm actually meeting Sunday with a, uh, it's the lady that does my taxes to help me out with uh, setting up or coming up with what I should do as far as a business account and everything to do with taxes and Bravo. such. Bravo. So. Perfect. Okay. And she'll, she'll tell you open a business account. Keep that. Set. Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, you will have to do an evaluation on me. Typically, I don't know if you have an evaluation form, but what you should do is um, in person, we take the evaluation forms, but what I would want you to do is give an evaluation to Rachel. Do you meet with Rachel at all? Uh, I've met with Rachel before. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Darren has, should get you one or somehow you get one or at least send an email or a text and give your impression how the class was for you, 
what your overall thoughts were. Uh, did you did you get good training? And just give just give a little blurb about how you felt. And I'm not going to try to coach you at all. That's from you, good, bad, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. But they, it's really important that they understand because they're providing this training that it's either working or it's not working. So oh, yeah. that would good. be up to you. Okay. And I appreciate you. I wish you the best success. I'm sure I'll see you at some point. And uh, if I can help you in any way going forward, you guys just let me know. All righty. Thank you for everything. You, Carol. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for putting up with my uh, coughing and hacking at the beginning of the week. <laughs> that was awful. All right, you guys. Appreciate you very much. Thanks. See ya. Best of success. Thank, Thank you. you. See ya.